And we want to begin the first lesson today. So for the next couple of weeks, we'll be, we'll be looking at the seven mountains of influence, which I'm sure are familiar to some of us. So we just want to consider them and just allow the Lord to speak to us on how we can make a difference, how we can influence these seven mountains of influence. And we want to begin with influencing government and politics. And this could not have come at a better time. And especially right now, when the, when the country right now is so much engaged in, in politicking and thinking about 2022, uh, the, you know, everybody just going around and people are lining and realigning themselves to this party, to that party. Everybody wants to be president. Everybody wants to be governor. And also so much, I mean, of course, some of it is really, really uh, bad politics that is already happening. But then we as Christians and, of course, as uh, citizens of this country, we have a responsibility. We definitely have a responsibility when it comes to influencing this particular mountain. Politics is a big deal in Kenya, in Africa at large. You know, but specifically in Kenya, politics is a big, big deal. And we shall be discussing that even as we move along. So we want to just be able to explore and appreciate the importance of politics and government and how we can bring kingdom influence on this kingdom. We agree and uh, we confirm that this is definitely part of our lives, politics and government, that's part, of, that's part of our lives. So then how can we have an influence as God's people? Of course, we have heard this statement that Christians should not be involved in politics. It is too dirty, you know, and, and I know that's a statement you have heard in one form or the other, that politics is dirty. But I want to suggest to you that it is not politics that is dirty. It is the politicians who are dirty. Are you with me? It is politicians. It's actually politicians. It's possible to have good, healthy, wholesome, constructive politics. It is very possible. And there are many examples around the world of nations that have healthy and wholesome, holistic politics. But again also, it is possible to have bad and dirty politics. People have died as a result of bad politics. Nations have gone into war as a result of bad politics. Poverty has gripped nations as a result of bad politics. In this nation, we can attest that we have also been victims many times of bad politics. So we want to just break this down and uh, see you know, how, what direction it will go as we move along. So the first thing we want to do is to be able to understand the nature the, uh, of politics and government. So the first question we want to ask, what is politics and government. Now, politics, we need to underscore, is important for directing the affairs of a group, community, or nation. Politics is important for directing the affairs of a group, community, or a nation. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says, Can two walk together unless they agree? So it's important for us to underscore that. It is important. Politics is important. We cannot, uh, you know, just assume that because uh, we have very bad politics in this country that we will not bother about our politics. It's important for us to be concerned, to be bothered about it because, because politics are, is actually very important in directing the affairs and the well-being of our nation. The second thing that we need to underscore is that politics becomes dirty when it is corrupted. Are you with me? And who corrupts politics? It is people, isn't it? It is human beings. We are the ones who can either be a good politician or a bad politician. Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 to verse 9. Now Daniel so distinguished himself. Now, even as we read that verse, one thing that is very peculiar and interesting about Daniel, Daniel, of course, is listed among the Old Testament prophets, but Daniel was a unique kind of a gentleman in the sense that he was not... He was not like some of the classical prophets, like Jeremiah or Isaiah. Uh, Daniel we, is, is a kind of a prophet that 
wore many hats. He was, of course, a prophet, but he was also a diplomat. He was a man who was working, of course, find, finds himself with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are taken to Babylon, deported or exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon. But Daniel finds himself working in the king's palace. He is a diplomat. He, is, he distinguishes himself. And he ends up working under several kings in Babylon, not in Jerusalem. He's a Jew, but working in a foreign land. So here we are told that he so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. This guy was exceptional that even the king acknowledged there was something special about him. But of course, that of course resulted in a lot of problems uh, for, for Daniel as you read the rest of that particular scripture. You know, because there were some who were not happy, they were not, they were not impressed by Daniel. But I think the important lesson for us to note there is that it is important for you, if you're in government or as a politician, to actually distinguish yourself. How you act, the values that you espouse, the principles that guide you. Esther chapter 3 verse 5. We are told of a story there. Haman, you remember the story of Haman and Mordecai. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel or, 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 or down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. He said, Haman, instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of success. You remember, you remember this story of Esther in the book of Esther. And uh, Mordecai was a man of God. He was a Jew. But then we have this guy called Haman. Haman was a, a government official, a powerful guy, but who decided to use or misuse his authority. Mordecai was a man of principle. Haman, of course, was a corrupt leader. And Mordecai decided to use his authority to destroy not just Mordecai, but I want you to notice a terminology there that is very familiar in this country. He's, he, 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 he decided to destroy Mordecai's people. Are you with me? In Kenya, it seems everyone has their own people. Now, here's a good example. Somebody is arrested in this country. Maybe they are suspected of being uh, corrupt. Maybe he's a government official. And they have been brought before the judicial system. And suddenly, everybody from th their, that person's ethnic group comes out and begins saying, our people are being molested. Our people are being targeted. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Who are your people? You're very quiet. This stuff is usually very quiet. Who are your people? Is the person standing or sitting next to you your people? Okay, you're not sure whether it's a trick question. Now, look at the person next to you. You may know them, you may not know them. Is that your people? You're just saying, are that your people? Let me ask you. I know we don't come from the same village. Am I your people? Until 2022. <laughs> Isn't that how we are as Kenyans? Our people. So when I say my people, actually in Kenya, when I say my people, everybody will know who I'm talking about, isn't it? When you stand up and say your people, everybody will know who we are talking about. Notice, Haman wants to destroy Mordecai's people. How I pray in this country, we one day will have leaders who, when they stand up and say my people, they are referring to the whole country. Are you with me? For instance, right now, there are people who are dying of hunger. In 10 counties in this country, they're dying of hunger. Should I be concerned? Are those my people? <laughs> May the Lord help us, honestly. Because in this country, it's about my people. Suddenly, the, the politicians, those who want to become president and what of you, everybody is retreating to their people. Have you noticed? We from Mount Kenya, you know, by the way, today we are going to be very honest. I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. 
All right? I'm going to make you very... Let me tell you. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I watch some of these guys on TV and say, we from this region, we have decided... I always wonder, uh, was I in that meeting? You are speaking for me? We will vote as a block. You and who? Does anybody go through the same... Because I'm like, why are you speaking for me? Who said? Who gave you a right to speak on my behalf? How do you know that that's, what, that's how me I want to vote? Does it mean because I come from this region, I must vote the same way? Or, oh, we are waiting for our leader to tell us how to vote. Really? Okay. I told you I'm going to make it. You're looking at me right now. Are you, are you there? But I always wonder, why would I wait for somebody... To tell me that based on their assessment that we people from this region are going to vote as a block for so and so. The devil is a liar. But that's what we do. So then one day, 2022, of course now suddenly all our tribal chiefs will stand up and say, we from this region have decided. Were you in that discussion? Did they ask you for your opinion? So why should I vote the way they say, they say that we should vote? I pray that God will deliver us from this my people mentality. What is a political system? Let's define some bit of uh, political systems that there are. Of course, number one, to totalitarianism is a system where the leader has total authority over everyone and makes all decisions, like dictators. Remember, we've, I mean, I think in our times we have also seen dictators all over the world, Idi Amin and Adolf Hitler, people like those, you know, people who ruled with such authority and nobody had any right to say anything. Yes, such chapter 1, verse 19. Therefore, if it, pleases, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree. So in other words, you find totalitarianism is a, a, a kind of leadership where the leader has ultimate authority. Whatever he says, he proclaims, becomes law. And everybody must obey. Authoritarian, there's also another second system is authoritarianism is a system characterized by a strong central power for in the, uh, no, uh, no room for individual freedoms. All right? Strong central power with no room for individual freedoms. Mark 10, 42, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the high officials exercise authority over them. And then you can also be able to read for yourself from Second Chronicles. Number three, we have another political system called a democracy. Democracy is a system where decisions are made in consultation with members. Kenya is a democracy, or at least we think it is, isn't it? All right. That is why every five years we go and we cast our ballot and we elect leaders. By the way, that is why uh, one of the things you may have noted in our announcements is that we are encouraging you, we are asking you, uh, and we are insisting that if you are not yet registered as a voter in readiness for next year's elections, please go and, go and register yourself. Because voting is not an option for a citizen. It is a responsibility. Yes, it is a right, but it is also a responsibility. Are you with me? Don't let others vote for you. Please, remember your vote is your right. It is your voice. And it's important as a child of God to, be, to participate in the elective process of a nation. So we are supposed to be a democracy here. Now, you remember there's one instance of a democracy that is given to us in Acts chapter 6 from, from verse 2. Uh, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, It will not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the, of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You remember the scenario in Acts chapter 6. 
as uh, there was, uh, of course, were involved in uh, distribution of food, and then some of the the, the, the people who were supposed to receive the food, uh, they began complaining. They said there was discrimination. And then the apostles who used to do this responsibility felt, of course, the church was growing. The responsibilities of the ministries were growing. So they, they opted and felt, no, no, it's not right for us to continue serving tables, distributing food, and yet we are supposed to be preaching and praying. So they say, they told the people, why don't you choose among yourselves six men full of the Holy Spirit that we will turn this over this responsibility so that we can concentrate on the ministry of the word. Now, of course, that was a form of democracy, a small form of democracy, because then the people had a responsibility to choose from among themselves men who fitted this particular criteria that they were given. That's what democracy does. So sometimes you may find in a group of people like this, we may, we may decide, uh, maybe it's a group of, uh, maybe a ministry, we say, why don't you choose among yourselves somebody who can lead you? And that is a form of democracy. Number four is another political system is a theocracy. Theocracy is a system where decisions are made in accordance with God's revealed will. Like the nation of Israel in the Old Testament was a theocracy. First Samuel chapter 30 verse 7. Then David sent to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? You remember in that culture, in those days, and in that time, the nation was, was governed by God. Even before they first, they had, before they first, uh, they had their first king, the nation was under God's jurisdiction. He was the one who was in charge. And you'll find that even like, for example, like King David or the kings, sometimes before they went to war, before they engaged in any major decision, they first called for the priest and the priest will come and uh, he will make inquiry of the Lord. And, and then the God will speak and then the king will know what to do. That is a theocracy. In other words, God is sovereign. He is supreme. He's the one who is in charge and he's in control. The nation of Israel, of course, in the Old Testament, they had the law. They, God had given them his law and that law was supposed to govern the nation. And we have to ask ourselves, and of course, it's a raging debate a lot of times. Is the church a democracy or a theocracy? Which is which? How many of you think it's a, it's a democracy? Okay, how many of you believe it's a theocracy? Okay, how many of you have no idea? Majority of you didn't put up your hand. Is the church a democracy or a theocracy? It is a what? It's a theocracy. Is both of them equally? <laughs> In other words, it's a raging debate. But ultimately, the church is supposed to be a theocracy first and foremost, isn't it? Why? Because we are guided by the word of God. So in other words, there are things that we don't bring our ideas as to what the church should be. We don't bring our ideas as to which, which command, commandments of God we should obey and which one we should, or what we should change or tweak and what of you. In other words, there are some things, of, the word of God is, 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 is permanent. It's our primary constitution, isn't it? In that sense, then it is a theocracy, isn't it? But then among us, we choose our own leaders, isn't it? All right? Because there's some form of governance that uh, how do we then, how do we exercise this theocracy in an organized fashion? And that is where now democracy comes in. So sometimes we will have ourselves choosing from among us who is going to lead this ministry, who is going to lead this uh, maybe uh, as an elder or a deacon or what have you. Are, are you with me? However, the democracy, our democracy should never supersede our theocracy. Are you with me? So for instance, we cannot decide to choose somebody who is a non-believer to become pastor in the church. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because we are guided by certain values and certain principles. But ultimately, the church is governed by God. That is why we pray. That is why we read the word. That's why we listen to his word. Because we want to hear, we want to hear him. We want to receive direction from him. Well, the second part is influencing politics and government. 
how uh, what uh, the first question there is why is it important to influence politics and government number one good governance brings joy and peace do you agree with that uh, in fact the bible says in proverbs 29 when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice but when a wicked man rules the people groan uh, have you noticed that um, no wonder Paul, Paul here writing to Timothy says, I urge then first of all that request prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and I want you to read with me. Alright? It's there right there in front of you. Alright? Can we read First Timothy chapter 2? I urge then first of all that request prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for who? everyone for kings and all those in authority that we may live and quiet lives in all godliness and it means that i as a christian as a child of god i'm obligated to pray for all these all those in authority whether i voted for them or not are you with me whether i agree with them or whether i belong to the same party with them or not I don't pray for leaders based on, on popularity. I pray for them because they are in that office. Why? Because I know that God can use them to bless this nation. Are you with me? So sometimes it doesn't add, uh, it doesn't add any value for me to get angry because my candidate was, never ele was not elected. So for the next five years, I'm angry. I say I cannot even pray for them. <laughs> that is foolishness. Are you with me? How many of you know God can use anybody? Surely if God can use a donkey, I think he can use some of these politicians too. Come on, can we talk in this house? And by the way, I pray that even as we go into 2022 and even other, other, other elections as, uh, you know, in the future, that God will change our mentality as, as Kenyans. That, that even as we go to the polls, we will, not be so, we will not be so drunk with our candidate. That sometimes, I mean, we pray God give us the right people. So that as I go to the ballot box, I am going there under conviction. And not because that guy is from my ethnicity. Can I tell you something? Can I, be, can I make you uncomfortable? Even if the next president is from your ethnic community, I promise you it will not put food on your table. You will still have to wake up in the morning. You will still have to work hard. For me, let me tell you, me, my principle is simple. I don't care where the next president comes from. I don't care whether he's from Turkana, whether he's Burji, whatever that is. I don't care whether he's a Mwindi. As long as he's a God-fearing man. As long as he's somebody who God can use. Are you with me? What does it profit if it's from my tribe? <laughs> Can I tell you something about some of our leaders? You may have even grown up, grown up in the same village you used to play football together. That guy becomes member of parliament. Try calling him. Has, have you, has any of you ever, had, ever gone through an experience where a politician gave you their number? Call me. And then you tried calling. Ashikangi Simu. And the day they answer, oh, when Shimo is busy, he will call you back. How many of them have ever called you back? Come on, talk to me, people. But that's how it is, that's, isn't it? So sometimes we fight for these guys. They get there, they forget you. In fact, in fact, <laughs> one of the things I, I, I normally find interesting is that, is that somebody who was in the community, was used to come to sit on Buruburu, for example. They, 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 everybody knows them in the estates. We even visit, they even belong to our Bible study group and what have you. And then we are together. The day that person becomes elected, have you noticed? Suddenly they have five bodyguards to protect them from you. Isn't that what happens? Have you ever, not, have you ever looked at our politicians? I mean, they, 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 they walk around with 10 people. Atimueshimiwa has to be protected. From who? From the people who are paying his salary? <laughs> Friends, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. May God give us the right leaders in this country. 
Are you with me? Not the right tribe, but the right leaders who can lead this nation. Listen, how many of our politicians right now, we're in a pandemic, aren't we? How many of them are talking about coronavirus and the economic effects it has had on this country? And how many of them are trying to offer solutions? How many? One? Two? Have you heard of them lately? What do they talk about? What are they talking about right now? 2022 elections in a country that is dying of starvation. Are you with me? It's about them. They want to, and of course, some of them are there telling us big things of the things that they will do. And these, some of these guys have been in power for 30 years. How come you have never done those things? What is the magic that 2022 will bring? Can we ask those questions, people? Are you with me? I know you're uncomfortable, but can we ask those questions? Yet we are the people who will fight for them all. Oh, so and so must become Uheshimiwa, you know, and so on and so forth. Political power, friends, can easily corrupt good intentions. Power uh, is good, power is sweet. But somebody has said that, um, that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 10. Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. In other words, you can actually end up in political power, but end up, instead of using your power and authority for good reasons, you end up oppressing the people. Number three, without godly influence, even the best of leaders can become corrupt. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some people start off very well, but sometimes if they are not well guided, uh, if they don't have godly influence in them, they can become easily corrupted people. Some of the people who have ruled this world, even here in Africa, some of them started off very well. Some of them were freedom fighters. Then they ended up in power. They stayed for too long. And that's the curse of Africa sometimes. People stay in power for too long. You know, I think that one of the keys to leadership is knowing when to quit. And normally you're supposed to quit when you're ahead. All right? So you have served your time. Things are happening things are going on well. You remember like Nelson Mandela, one of the people, one of the icons of leadership, I think, in the world is a man called Nelson Mandela. Now, uh, Nelson Mandela was a man who was not power hungry. He was a man who they almost literally had to, had to uh, impress on him to run for president. He was not interested, but he knew, I'm just coming to serve for this term. Once my term is done, the man was happy to go home, not power hungry. Nelson Mandela never enriched himself from the presidency. He was a servant of the people. Nelson Mandela did not allow power to corrupt his head. He never misused his authority. By the way, if you really, really think about it, when Nelson Mandela came to power, here is a man who had been uh, incarcerated for how long? 27 I'm not sure how many of us will have had the grace to live with the people who have imprisoned you for 27 years. Now you have power. How many of you would have done a few things? Remembering what they did to you. How many of you? I mean, honestly. Are, are you with me? And it would have been very easy for him, by the way. He could have destroyed the National Party in South Africa. He could have destroyed those whites in South Africa, but he restrained himself and instead sought to build a rainbow nation. That's a man of character who did not allow power to corrupt him. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of Saul. The Bible tells us about him uh, in verse, uh, chapter, nine, chapter 19, verse 9. But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in the house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. You remember Saul? Saul was the first king of the nation of Israel. He had a great opportunity. He could have been a great leader. He could have been a great man. By the way, when you read his account, here is a man who God specifically sent Saul. 
to go and find while Saul was looking for his father's uh, lost donkeys. He has been anointed by the prophet himself. And even when he is presented to the people, the people rejoice as all oh, the hope of Israel is in the whole desire of the whole nation for you. I mean, he was a man who would have used that uh, privilege and authority he had. He could have been a great man, by the way. But the man had issues. The man had insecurities. See, Saul, by the way, we are told, uh, you know, one of the things that we are described about, about him, his biography, uh, you remember we are told that the man was head and shoulders above his brother. The guy was Saul. Have you ever noticed that there are people who just have uh, a, a physique that just looks like a leader? You know, this guy, when they enters a room, you don't know him, but you just want to stand. Have you ever seen those guys? Good looking, confident, even if the guy has nothing in his head. Just his physique, he looks like, like, like he's, up, he's, he's important. Anybody who's like, okay, anybody who has ever met people like that? Are, are you with me? They already have something going for them. Of course, we know leadership is more than just your physical stature. But Saul was like that. He was head and shoulder. He was, he was tall. In other words, if you put him among his brethren, about, among his, uh, his, his peers, the guy would stand up among them. And everybody will notice, wow, that is Saul. That was quite something. A man that is amazing. And of course, you know that, uh, I was going to talk about short people, but I'm not going to go there. All right? But, but Saul had it going for him, and the guy could have actually been a great man. By the way, uh, did you hear this um, story about some four Catholic ladies who were having tea one day? Uh, these fourth Catholic ladies were having tea one day, and one of them, you know, after taking a sip of, of, of tea, says to the others, says, by the way, my son is a priest. And whenever he walks into a room, all the ladies say, Father. <laughs> the second lady, you know, of course, also taking a cup of, you know, a, a sip from her tea, uh, oh, she says, she looks at the other women and says, my son is a bishop. And when he walks into a room, all the ladies say, your grace. The third lady also squares up and she says, oh, my son is a cardinal. When he walks into the room, all the ladies say, your eminence. Then the fourth lady kind of sits quietly. She's not saying anything. The other three start looking at her. You know those suggestive look like, what about you? Tell us about your son. So eventually she clears her throat and then takes a sip of tea and says, my son is a six foot two, hard bodied with a six pack. He is a true male specimen. When he walks into the room, all the ladies say, Oh my God. <laughs> Some of you missed it. It's okay. Don't worry. It's not in the notes. Don't look for it in the book. It was supposed to wake you up. How can believers influence the political and governance systems of the kingdom of God? For the kingdom of God? Micah chapter 6 verse 8, he has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly. I want to give you three keys here. How we can influence is to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Are you with me? To act, say justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. By the way, if you, can, if you can capture those three things, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, or you will have nailed it. The one of the challenges that I find with African political leadership in Africa, it is tied to none of these things. It's all about position, and acquisition of power. That's all it is about. Have you noticed how our political leaders, more often than not, wield their power around? Even in traffic, even when there's no traffic, they have to come with their sirens and push you out of the road. I wonder, I don't know, does that upset any of, any of anybody here? Or is it just me? Because maybe you need to pray for me. Because I'm thinking, first and foremost, I also have important business to attend to. Your business is not more important than mine. Are you with me? 
in the morning you're going to the office and then suddenly the traffic is stopped and then you have this guy coming waving and with wow, sirens as, as if you have made a mistake being on the road they are pushing everybody out of the road because Muhammad has to get to the office in my head I'm wondering if you wanted to get there early you should have left early like every other Kenyan are you with me you find this guy he's going to the office he has an entourage of how many vehicles Come on, let's talk. We are having an honest conversation here. How many vehicles? Five vehicles. Gazlers for that matter. All of them are full with men and women. All right? And the guy, so you're wondering, this man, is he a god? In other words, there has to be a, a, a show of prominence, a show of power, a show of opulence. And by the way, guess who is paying the bill? Come on, talk to me, Kenyans. Who is paying the bill? You and me. The other day I'm driving, minding my own business. I'm in an intersection somewhere on the road. And this guy, suddenly I just, you know, the way they just, you just hear, first you hear these sirens. And you're wondering, wait, what is going on? Then, then this, uh, normally the house of Barus, eh? the, 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 the chase car. Then this guy, of course, you know the way they normally drive. And, the, and the, uh, some of the, what are they called, the security guys. They are, the, half of their body is out of the vehicle. You know? So this guy comes holding a walkie-talkie you know they hold their walkie-talkie you know and then the, the guy comes and so me i'm just at the intersection minding my own business i want waiting for a way to clear so that i can get into the on the main road and the guy comes and literally starts telling me to get out of the very angrily and i'm thinking what have i done why are you angry with me i pay your salary this is my road this is my country i am a kenyan like you are you with me? I am, we are not second-rate citizens, people. You have no right to push me out of the road. And so that Muhejimiwa can pass. Watch out, apange queue. How will he know the troubles of Kenyans? When Kenyans are sleeping on the road, on Mombasa Road, how will he know if we have to keep clearing the road for them? Are you hearing what I'm saying? But we are the ones who have created this culture. It's not a culture of humility. It's a culture of humiliation. As Kenyans, we're always being humiliated. One time, I'm seated in, my, in a restaurant with my family. We're just having a meal. We've just finished. And then the waiter comes very quickly, running to us. He comes and tells us, I should stand up and clear the table and leave because Muheshimiwa is coming. If Muheshimiwa is paying my meal, are you with me? And I'm thinking in my head, why should I leave? There's an empty table there. There's an empty table there. He can sit like every other normal Kenyan. But we are the ones who finance that lifestyle. We are the ones who encourage that lifestyle. Why can't we begin putting our foot down? The other day, I'm driving and 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 this 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 so-called mwishimiwas have come with a whole bus i don't know what was going on they are on the other side the wrong side of the road they have created traffic jam are you with me i'm wondering is this necessary as kenyans why do we allow ourselves this is not humility this is not servant leadership this is humiliating for Kenyans. did you see a clip the other day that was making rounds on social media of the of boris johnson the Prime Minister of the, of, the, of the UK. I don't know how many of you saw that clip where somebody found him in a supermarket. You know, the way you're in a supermarket, you're just getting ready to pay. And then this person realized, this looks like Boris Johnson. And true, true to, to his word, it was actually Boris Johnson. So this person removes their mobile and starts taking, of course, so excited. I mean, the, prime, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, this guy is more powerful than any African president. But guess what? The guy is standing behind a queue <laughs> in a small supermarket with his polythene paper bag. In fact, I thought if he was in Kenya, he would have been arrested. <laughs> like on a plastic. Alright? The guy is unperturbed. No, there was no bodyguard around him, no aid around him. Then the guy finishes. This person is still taking a video. The guy goes out. Some people manage to get him to take a selfie. Then he goes, and guess what? There is no siren waiting for him. There is no bodyguard waiting for him. He goes, removes some key. His, his bicycle was tied to a post. <laughs> In fact, I thought, 
man, if I was there, I, would, I should have stolen that bicycle. Can you imagine stealing the bicycle of the prime minister? But a thief for one day, you know. The guy takes his bicycle and rides off. And I thought, if it was in Kenya, <laughs> MCA, <laughs> yeah. the clear superman who was born in to Kenya. Really, guys? Really? The members of parliament in UK, when they're going to the office in the morning, they ride the underground train. You can be seated. If it's full, the guy stands. Are you with me? And he's going to parliament. In Kenya, fill in the blank for yourself. Are you, are you, getting, are you getting where I'm coming from in all this? Is that servant leadership? Here is the other scenario, and I'm about to quit. Here is the other scenario. It is, has been saved. This is not a secret. When there are all these, uh, like sometimes when they have, uh, maybe, let's, let's just take an example. Sometimes they have to go to New York for the, um, you know, some of these UN meetings, all right? So bringing in all these leaders from all over the world and what have you. The most expensive entourages are usually from where? Guess what? Africa. Are you with me? Now, here's a scenario. True scenario. So, they are meeting in New York. So, they, every country from all over the world, they have sent their delegates. You'll find people from the West. You'll find maybe people from Europe. Uh, you know, and these are, these, are, these, these, these are top politicians. These are top leaders in their country. Somebody will come maybe with an aid or two to the most. They will come and find the most fairly praised hotel, uh, prized hotel in New York. All right? In the morning, they will be grabbing a taxi to go for the meeting. To Kopamoja. Please don't sleep on me on this one. Because some of you will become Heshimi one, one day. You will remember this sermon. All right? So in the morning, they're staying in a fairly prized hotel. The, the guy came with his entourage was only maybe two or three people to the most. All right? In the morning, as he's going to the meeting at the UN headquarters, he will be riding a taxi, looking for a taxi or an Uber, by the way. Are you with me? That is from people, delegates from Europe, delegates from the US, from North America. Now, let's look at the delegates from Kenya. <laughs> First of all, this Muheshimiwa came with a delegation of 20 people. I'm serious. All right? 20 people. They will look for the most expensive hotel. Are you with me? All right? All these 20 people are on per diem. You know per diem? Free money. Because you traveled. All right? Now, in the morning, remember he's sleeping in the most expensive hotel. In the morning when they're going to the UN headquarters for the meeting, they hire the most expensive limousine for Muheshimiwa. Are you with me? They go to the meeting, and guess what? This Muheshimiwa went there to beg <laughs> for money from these wazungus. I mean, honestly, if I came to your house, Professor, I came to your house begging and I came in my, in my limousine. Say, <laughs> what would you, okay, I'm a, I'm a pastor. Imagine I'm your pastor. I came with my nice limousine, nice suit, the medunga. Came to your house. Me naomba uno just sata rent si jalipa. What would you tell me? Even if I'm your pastor, even if, even if I'm your, what would you tell me? Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Am I right? No wonder sometimes the West does not respect us. Are you with me? Because sometimes they're saying, "We give you money. This is where your money goes." We who can afford this kind of lifestyle uh, uh, have the sense enough not to misuse public resources. How I pray God will give us a generation of leaders in this country that will be conscientious. As they spend money, they will remember this money belongs to Kenyans. Yeah, please clap. Go ahead. <laughs> Believers must pursue both social service and social action. 
Believers must pursue both social service. Now, let's just do a comparison of this very quickly. Social service, this is what we are supposed to do as Christians. Uh, we are supposed to relieve human need. So, for example, maybe somebody is in need, maybe somebody needs clothing. Uh, I think as Christians, we should be able to give them clothing, or they need food. We should be able to give them something, whatever they need. But social action, and we have a social action here, a ministry here in Sitam. Social action means removing the cause of that human need. So, for example, right now, we have hunger in 10 counties in this country, isn't it? People are dying of hunger. Now, it is one thing, of course, we will send them food because that's the immediate need. However, in governance or in social action, what we should be also thinking about is that, yes, we'll give you food for today, but we need to alleviate the cause of your starvation. Are you with me? So that next year, you don't have to come crying for food. Is it Nyerere uh, who said, you, you, you know, you give, give a man a fish or you can teach him how to fish, all right? So unfortunately, sometimes all we do is just give fish. Let's teach them how to fish. Uh, social service, practice social philanthropy. But social action takes it to the next level. It says engage political and economic advocacy. Social service, minister to individuals and communities, which we do all the time. But social action means that we transform oppressive systems and structures of society. Then finally, social service means engaging in works of mercy. But social action means advocate for social and economic justice. Are you noticing the difference? So we take it to the next level. So in other words, as Christians, we are not just involved in service, but we should also be involved in social action advocacy we should speak up for the vulnerable we should try those of you in government offices or some of you in positions where uh, policies are enacted it is your responsibility using your christian influence to go and put in place policies that will alleviate some of these uh, sources of injustice in our country believers should influence policy as i've already said through godly knowledge and wisdom so please go and influence uh, those policies that are being formulated believers should be courageous advocates of justice and righteousness listen we need to be courageous advocates by the way historically speaking the people who always fought, fought for justice in the world have always been christians by the way are you with me but it seems to be dwindling over time but Christians, men and women who are so convicted by the gospel were also advocates of social justice. They advocated courageously for equality in society. We can think of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who fought for equal rights in the U.S., you know, uh, fighting for the rights of the black people. That is a responsibility of God's people, of Christians. See, we are not just saved so that we can go to heaven. We are saved so that we can also have influence in this life and in this country. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? That is why it should bother us as God's people. Why should we, so many years later after gaining independence, why should people still be dying of starvation in a country that produces so much food in a year? It should bother us. Are you with me? It, it should bother me. It should bother you. We should be able to speak out. We should be able... One, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, good. We need justice even with our microphones here. Listen, we should be bothered, by the way. We should be bothered. We should be bothered about the poverty situation in this country. But let me put it, let me take it further. Because sometimes we, when we talk about issues to do with justice, we only think about government or those big offices. Sometimes we, we remove ourselves from all scenarios because it's, ah, me, I'm not in government. I'm not, I'm not a big person where I am. But listen to me. Are you practicing justice in your home? Some of us, many of us here, have employed house helps. 
Am I right? There are people who work in your houses. They are there to serve you. You brought them into your home because you needed help. But it is unfortunate that some of the most oppressed people, some of the people who go through the greatest acts of injustice are actually right in our homes and they're called house helps. Modern day slavery, friends, is here with us. And unfortunately, even among God's people, the way our house helps sometimes are treated, house helps are, are, are beaten up physically in some of our homes. We shout at them for some people. I mean, we mistreat them. Some of them, even the salary you promise to give them, it is never forthcoming. You give it to them whenever you feel like. Or even the wage that you're giving them, you know is below. You know it is a wage that is unjust. Friend, you cannot be a person who serves a God of justice and treat another human being that way. I said I'm going to make you uncomfortable because these are real things. Are you with me? The, with some of us, even, even the food, we only, the, the house help only eats after we have all eaten. Because they're only supposed to eat leftovers. That's unjust. I cannot say that I am a man of God unless I am practicing justice in my own house. Is that house helps life becoming better because they came in contact with you? Is their life becoming better because they have served you in your home? Or are they full of bitterness? Are they full of hate? bitterness and anger and rage and when they look at you they can't even believe that you have the nerve to say praise the lord friends that's what justice looks like i may not have a lot of money to pay my house help but surely that does not mean i cannot treat them well because the same blood that saved me is the same blood that was shed for that young lady for that young man in my home before god listen before God, when God looks at us, that person, that young lady is my brother, is my sister in the Lord. Are you hearing me? Yes, they may be orphaned. And maybe they only ended up in your home because they were orphaned. They couldn't continue with school. Are you doing anything? Maybe to try and get them back into school. Maybe they ended up in your home because of some really difficult circumstances. What am I doing to better the life of that person in my house? I, one time in Sitom Woodley, when I was there briefly, and, and we talked about this matter, and I talked about how we treat our house helps. And after the service, I was accosted. About 10 ladies accosted me just at the altar. They couldn't wait for me, so they came, and then they, they said, Pastor, we want to talk to you. Though, you know, they were young and old and some of them were actually foreigners, could hardly understand English. They came, about 10 of them, they came and said, Pastor, we want to talk to you. So uh, I said, okay, what is it? And they told me, Pastor, we are house helps. We come to this church. And you know what they said? They said, Pastor, thank you for speaking for us. Because they said, all of us here, we are employed by members of this church. Are you with me? C can we display compassion? Can we display that young girl maybe was orphaned. They've come to your house. Why don't you treat them like your daughter? Are you with me? Why don't you just embrace them like, like, like your daughter? Let them know that, that you care for them. Our young, you know, we've been talking about our young people going to Saudi Arabia. And being mistreated, some of them going out there and coming back in, 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 in coffins. But sometimes that injustice is not that far. Sometimes it's right here in our own country. I beg you, Christians, I beg you on behalf of our house helps. Please, I ask you. God brought that young person into your house for a purpose and a reason. May the Lord use you to be a source of blessing to that person. May the Lord use you.
believers should be actively involved in appointment of leaders and formation of government. I've already said that. We must be involved. We must take part. We must participate. Next year, please, I ask you, let's get ready. Let's participate. Believers should seek elective and appointive positions in government. Please, let's not just allow people out there to be the ones to seek elective positions. If God is calling you into that area, if God is calling you into politics, we wish you well. We will pray for you. Are you with me? Take that step of faith. Take the plunge. Who knows? Maybe there's an MCA seated next to you here. Who knows? Maybe there's a member of parliament here. By the way, who knows? Maybe the next governor of Nairobi is here. That will be very good. Because we have a few things that need to be done. By the way, who knows? Maybe there's a president among us here. And if, that, if any of you is in those positions, when you get to those positions, please remember us. Please come to church. And when you come to church, don't demand anything. The same seat you have been sitting. Uh, you're quiet in here. Are you hearing me? The same seat. Even after they elect you, come and sit on the same seat. Because the God who called you, he called you while you were seated on that seat. Why should you change position? <laughs> Believers should serve with diligence and a sense of excellence. I'm skipping this, the verses. You can read that for yourself. Believers in government should not be corrupt. I think that goes without saying. We are not called to corruption. Believers should expose and act on wickedness in their workplaces and in society, in government, wherever you are. It is your, there's a reason why God has put you in there. Now, granted, here is the thing, friends. Sometimes when we are the whistleblower, when we are the ones who refuse to be involved in corruption, it may cost us. It may cost us friends. It may cost us our jobs sometimes. It may cost us our position. It may cost you your promotion. All right? Because you stood up for what is right. But you've been a good place. Let me tell you. You would rather the Lord bless you because you stood up for something and you were treated unjustly than for you to go and be involved in corruption or things that, that are not right. And at the end of the day, yes, you may earn the praises of men, but you will forever feel that sense of, of failure that I should have done the right thing. I should have said something. I should have stood for something. Believers should constantly pray for the nation and for all those in authority, it is our responsibility to also be on our knees praying for our country, praying for the president and all those that are in authority. And in conclusion, we say this. In every action we take, we are doing either of two things. We are either helping create hell on earth or helping to bring a foretaste of heaven. We are either contributing to the broken condition of the world or participating with God in transforming the world to reflect his righteousness. We are either advancing the rule of Satan or establishing the reign of God. Now, if we are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, then we must arise and deliberately seek to conquer the mountain of government and politics. Our aim should be to see the fulfillment of John's vision in Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and, and ever. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Please let's all rise up on our feet as we bring this service to a close. Thank you for your patience. Even as we're going through that lesson, we'll continue next Sunday.